A Legacy of African American Skilled Labor and Entrepreneurship The Colonial Era Through the Civil War From America's beginnings, the contributions of black slave labor were an important part in developing a strong economy for our country. Slaves with particular talents and skills were highly valued and sought after by slave traders and plantation owners. According to historians, close to 27% of adult male slaves in pre-Civil War Charleston were skilled craftsmen, such as gardeners, carpenters, blacksmiths, potters, coopers, millers, distillers, spinners, weavers, bricklayers, and seamstresses. These individuals were a vital part of what it took to maintain a plantation. Skilled labor could be profitable for both the slave owner and the slave. Some slave owners would lease out the services of a talented slave for extra money, with both the slave and the slave owner benefiting. There is evidence that in some instances, skilled labor enabled slaves to purchase their freedom. A local example of this would be the experience of Bonds Conway. Conway was a slave in Virginia in 1763 and was brought to Kershaw County in 1792. His owner, Peter Conway, allowed Bonds to hire himself out and earn money. By 1793, Conway had purchased his freedom by selling goods such as ginger beer and working as a carpenter. Another interesting and possibly lesser known local story is that of Lafayette George. Mr. George was a free carpenter born in 1827 and was traveling about in the Midlands of South Carolina in the 1840s and 50s. He was able to move about freely and work during slavery with the assistance of what were called passes. In order for George to obtain a work pass, he had to have a white person of stature to vouch for him. He must have been a quality carpenter because his wallet was found inside of a wall of one of the most prestigious buildings in Camden, the Robert Mills Courthouse. Reconstruction to Post-Reconstruction Post-Reconstruction South Carolina was an interesting place for both whites and Negroes. Tensions were high as people of both races struggled to figure out where they fit in in the new society. Many whites were economically displaced, and many newly freed Negroes were migrating to other areas for education and economic opportunity. This created a labor shortage. Some former slaves were content to work for their former plantation masters, but many were not. This created a complicated situation with white former slave owners being forced to negotiate terms of work with former slaves. This situation was new to both parties involved and proved to be an exercise in good communication and human relations to achieve a mutually desired outcome. This was a time when the Negro field labor and skilled Negro labor both possessed some form of control over their existence, however small it might have been. It was the skilled labor of the newly freed Negroes that would rise to the top. They could command their own price for their efforts, so it's not surprising that this class of individual would come to be a valuable asset to their community in terms of financial support and leadership. And many times the knowledge of a trade or skill will be passed down to ensure economic survival. After the Civil War, during Reconstruction, skilled labor and entrepreneurship seeped into politics. South Carolina was a majority Negro state and newly guaranteed freedoms, including participation in South Carolina politics, were available to some who would seize the moment. John A. Chestnut would be a prime example of someone taking advantage of these new freedoms. He was a member of the Loyal Union League and a delegate to the Radical Republican faction of the South Carolina House of Representatives. Chestnut played a role in reshaping the South Carolina Constitution into a more inclusive document. These changes would alter politics in this state for generations. These actions coming so soon after slavery would make him famous. African-American skilled labor and entrepreneurship in Camden 
Many recognize that Charleston's early rise was largely because it was and remains a port city. Port towns and cities usually foster more economic activity and cultural exchange by the very nature of how they tend to operate, with economies flowing across racial lines. Like Charleston, Camden was also an influential port and shipbuilding community in South Carolina history and benefited from this status. Port communities usually support more commerce and offshoot employment to support their existence than communities without ports. Although Charleston was the major hub of African American businesses and newspapers in South Carolina, Camden was also a center of African American commerce. In fact, one of the first African American general mercantile and grocery stores outside of Charleston was opened in Camden in 1873 by John Moreau Dibble. Soon after, his brother, E. H. Dibble, opened his own store in a building that still stands at the corner of Broad and DeKalb Streets in Camden. These were popular businesses that catered to both whites and African Americans. The Dibble family would become a powerful influence in the region with involvement in businesses and politics. E. H. Dibble was also a South Carolina state representative in post-Reconstruction South Carolina. As was mentioned earlier, Camden was a hub of economic activity. Newspaper accounts, going back as far as 1828, described the city as a thriving port with as many as 30 cargo boats a day going to Charleston and as many arriving. At times, Broad Street was described as being choked with traffic for several straight days. The geographic location, in addition to the river and shipbuilding port, most likely contributed to the opportunities available here. In the early part of the 20th century, Camden had all types of African American skilled tradespeople and businesses. Carpenters, masons, shoemakers, gas stations, barbers, laundresses, blacksmiths, doctors, lawyers, meat markets, dressmakers, and even African-American pressing clubs were represented. South Carolina's oldest inland city became a mecca for commerce. It is also apparent that some of these businesses were next to and around white-owned businesses in downtown Camden. Skilled labor and professional classes were supported by a range of area residents. If your house needed repair, you would need a carpenter such as Mr. Dees, Sutton, or DuBose. When a family member passed, one might contact the R.H. Hale or Collins Funeral Home. If you were building a structure or your walkway needed attention, you might contact a bricklayer such as Mr. Belton, Shedrick, or Chestnut. One would also have a number of barbers to choose from, such as Mr. English, McGirt, or Eugene Johnson. Clothes needed to be washed and your family might use the services of Mrs. Foster, Davis, or Dempsey. When your horse needed to be shod, or you had metal work to be done, Sammy James might be the blacksmith for the task. When someone in your family fell ill, Dr. J.P. Pickett might be called upon. Legal documents might need to be drawn up by H.F. McGirt. Afterwards, groceries could be picked up at Mrs. Price's store, or from Mr. Jenkins, or Williams. When a lady needed a new dress for that special event, Mrs. Gamble, McLean, or Conyers might be able to fit you into their schedule, and your dry cleaning might be done by the Everetti Pressing Club. And most shoe repair in Camden was being done by Mr. Duran, Jones, Thompson, Timbers, Perry, or Washington. Even Petros B. Dodonna, 
the long-serving principal of Jackson High School, was not only a noted educator and pastor, but was also involved in business. He was the sole distributor of three auto accessories in a six-county area. Camden really does have a legacy of African-American skilled labor and entrepreneurship.